started last week with the book of Romans. And in the past, I, uh, what was it? We took, took his Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, verse by verse, and we took the book of Galatians, <coughs> verse by verse. Two years back, we took Hebrew, Hebrews. Last year, we took Galatians. And uh, this year, doing the book of Romans, which is a long book, 16 chapters. So we can't do it verse by verse. Otherwise, we're going to do it till kingdom come, <coughs> which already came. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> the kingdom of God is within us. <laughs> but we're going to break, I, I started breaking it down last week. We went very briefly through the first couple of chapters. I, um, Martin Luther. Started a whole reformation from the Catholic Church because of one verse out of Romans. He started a whole new way of thinking, a whole new of way of understanding God. One verse, short, and the just will live by faith. And he realized, hang on, I don't need to pay for my sins in money to be forgiven because Jesus did it already. <laughs> and he realized that all these traditions they had, that's already done in Jesus. See, there's something about the fullness of the finished work on the cross that Jesus did already for us that we just need to step into. Now, that same what Luther said this about the book of Romans. He said, it is really the chief part of the New Testament and the purest gospel. It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word, by heart, but also that he should occupy himself in it every day as the daily bread of the soul. The more we deal with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. Mm -hmm. Now I think my dog heard that portion about um, it is precious, uh, the more precious it becomes and the better it, better it tastes. Because I was studying the book of Romans and we've got a puppy and I left it on the couch forgot what puppies do and he ate through chapter one and two <laughs> <laughs> and bite marks like it to Corinthians one <laughs> and I, when I saw that I just looked at him and he said come on dude <laughs> don't you know these people in the bible that ate scripture and said it was sweet in the mouth and but they in the stomach <laughs> so I just stick it back and this morning, oh not this morning, when I read this quote of Martin Luther, it's like, yo, even my dog agree with it. <laughs> and he says, it's impossible to read or meditate on this letter too much or too well. Calvin wrote, when we have gained a true understanding of this epistle, we have a door open to us, to all, to all, uh, to all most profound treasures of Scripture. Somebody said that if you understand Romans, you can understand the rest of the Bible. We started last week and we said that Paul wrote, normally wrote, writes in two or four blocks. And Romans the same. Just, it's one of his longest things. He started with a problem. Well, first over here, there's a portion where he greets everybody and says that he's on his way. He wants to go to Rome. Oh, then greeting them, beautiful. Um, and then he started sketching a problem and showing people how sinful the world is, how sinful mankind is. So it almost becomes depressing. To read it for, for three chapters. How bad everything is, how bad mankind is, and, 
And then he takes three people, almost as if he puts them in trial and say, okay, the one person looked at the universe that God created and the universe, that's Romans 1, where the universe was supposed to tell them that there is a creator and instead they started worshipping the creation. The second group of people is those like, man, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm okay. Look at me. I am just, but from a religious point of view, not in Christ. And then the third group of people, the Jew that says, look at me. I can teach you. I know the law, but never does what the law says. These are the three groups of people. And then and the change comes in the second block where it says solution new humanity, 3 verse 21. And I love that. Where it says, um, but now. It starts that new portion. It says, this is happening, but now. And then it tells us what Christ did on the cross. And part of that telling of what Christ did on the cross is this portion now when you're going to start with the solution of the new humanity that God is starting. So, you are very quiet. <laughs> it starts with chapter 4. These two portions in each chapter. It's interesting, I, I don't know, <coughs> I mean, it's not him that put the chapters there, but the person that did the chapters did it quite cleverly. There's in every chapter about two ideas that Paul is arguing. The first one in chapter 4 is two. The one is Abraham justified by faith and then the promise through faith. Romans 4, 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he was Something he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abram believed God, and and it was counted to him as righteousness. Then verse 9: Is this blessing then only for the circumcised, or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abram as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So the whole argument, going into this idea that God through Christ Jesus created a new humanity. Remember he went back to Adam? when he started speaking about the sinfulness of man, and now he went back to Abram. And remember what we said, that he spoke, he wrote to the book of Romans because of the division in the church. The Jews came back after five years that they were expelled from Rome, they came back with their ideas, the Gentile Christians that was there say, but hang on, uh -uh, we're not under these laws. The Jew says you are under laws and there was friction. So Paul is writing to bring this balance. <coughs> now Paul comes and he starts this portion of the new humanity and he starts with Abram because they very quickly point towards Abram. He's our father. Remember what Jesus said. If he was your father, why don't you do what he said? Mm -hmm. But you want to kill me. Mm -hmm. Because my words have no entrance into you. There's something about taking the word of God. And we said last week that it's not about race. It's not about skin color. It's about Christ in us that we became part of this new race that belongs to <coughs> what we say. Um, the family of God. Hmm. New race, new humanity, a new, it's a word that I'm looking for. Um, nationality. Nationality. This new nationality. So Paul is grabbing back to, to, to Abram and he said that he was, he was justified <coughs> through faith before circumcision. 
before the law. So it was not the law that justified them. It was justified before the law and even before circumcision. And then when you look at that chapter um, 4 onwards, you will see how Paul argues the fact that circumcision came as a sign because of justification that already happened. So it was an out, outward flow of that. It is that ancient old thing of um, moral living. In a lot of churches today, if you live morally, you are saved. Oh, man, thanks. <laughs> if, if you live morally, you are saved, and they are worried about you. If you live morally, you're okay. Because you look like everybody else, you speak like everybody else, you do as everybody else, and nobody is worried about you. Yeah. But moral living does not save us. Mm. See, primarily salvation is in Christ Jesus. Okay. And from Him, and from that place, moral living flows. Mm. And then we make it it. And, and I think Paul is coming here and he's doing the same. He says, you are looking at the law, you're looking at circumcision, and it's not that that made him righteous. It was the fact that he believed God that he was counted righteous. Mm -hmm. And the rest flowed from that. Circumcision came after that. Now, Romans 4.13, you will see from there onwards, he argues the whole thing about the promise through faith. Uh, for the promise to Abram and his offspring that he would be heirs of the world, did not come through the law, but through righteousness of faith. It is written, written, I have made you the father of many nations. In this presence of, in the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Isn't that awesome? In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations and as he had been told so shall your offspring be so then Paul argues the rest of chapter 4 that Abram stepped into righteousness because of faith but it was not only for him because how he stepped into this righteousness, righteousness was because God promised him something. He promised him an offspring. And because he trusted God, hope against hope, because his body was old and frail and his wife's body was old and frail, the Bible actually called it dead, and he <coughs> decided, you know what, God can do anything. I will believe him. <clears throat> and because of that, he was counted for just for righteousness. But now Paul comes and he says, but the promise that flowed from there was the promise that in his seed, now Galatians 3 explains this very nicely, it says in his seed, and then it points to the singular, in his seed the nations will be blessed. Now that nations in the Greek is ethnos, meaning the ethnic nations. What is an ethnic nation? It's a nation that's not your nation. Mm -hmm. they, the ethnic nations, the ones that's not the same as you are. So, Paul, Paul is saying that God promised Abram that the ethnic nations will be blessed in him. And then in Galatians, he says that that seed, singular, is pointing to Christ. Now it's interesting in Romans he never had that conversation again. All he said that in Abram, in Christ Jesus, nations are blessed and are pulled into the nation of God. So there's no longer, and that's why Paul argues in other um, letters as well, there's no longer Greeks, there's no longer Romans, there's no longer Jews, there's no longer Afrikaans, 
whites, there's no longer English whites, there's no longer coloreds, there's no longer Zimbabweans. All are one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter how you look, we've got the same dad. So because we've got the same dad, we are the same. Yes. And that's his whole argument here. Through when you read through chapter four, what you will see. <coughs> and then he comes in chapter five, and he says that if you have this faith, you will have peace with God. Mm. Now, I think it's this thing, the, the, the thing of. There's always this debate about assurance of salvation. Can one be sure that you are saved? Yeah. Where a lot of churches will tell you only one day when you stand in front of the gate, the angel will check in the book and say, okay, your name is here, you can go in. And then only you find out if you are saved or not. We cannot know now. But Jesus is walking with his disciples, and I've said this so many times, living and breathing. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said to them, you already have everlasting life. So everlasting life is present in your life while you are still breathing. The day we pass on is literally what it says. We pass on. It's a step from this dimension into the next dimension from this dimension that we are already, Ephesians, that says we are seated in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. From this already, Scripture goes so far to say, as He is, as He is, so are we in this world. So there is already something that happened here in this new humanity, in this new generation that God is creating, in this new, what's that word, Wynette? Um, race nationality. nationality in this nationality, in this race in this moment that God is creating that it's just a step into eternity <clears throat> so Paul is arguing this whole thing that, that we can have peace with God and that we should have peace with God because of our faith but then something beautiful happens the whole, up to chapter 5, he argues um, justification, righteousness, as a very technical thing, like, like a court case. But for the first time in Romans 5, he starts speaking about love. <coughs> but how beautiful he says. He says, um, I'm going to... Chapter 5, verse 5. You must actually read the top as well. But he says, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Maybe you can understand this. What did he say? God poured His love into our hearts. There's something about the liquid love of God. <laughs> yes, uh, living water. Years back, I listened to an interview that they had with Bruce Lee. And, and I can't remember why, but he said to, to this guy uh, that had the interview with him, he said, when you pour water into the teacup or into the teapot, it takes the shape of the teapot. Mm. And then he said very dramatically, and it becomes the teapot. Mm. And then he looks at the sky and he said to him, Become water, my friend, become water. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
See, liquid takes on the form that it's been poured in. And it's so beautiful when it says that God poured out His love. And it's the first time that He's speaking about love in Romans. And it's been poured out into our hearts. And water take on the shape of the container that you pour it into. Wherever you are in life, wherever you are in understanding of the gospel, God's love, liquid love, can seep into every crack, every nook, every, what do you call it, gap. And, 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 and it's full. And when we saturate it with His love, we will know. Mm. I'm okay. See, sometimes we need the legal part to understand what justification is. That we know that it's a right standing in Christ Jesus before God. But it's not only clinical. It's not only a legal thing. There's a great aspect of love with us. Mm -hmm. I walk with Him. I breathe because of Him. And it's all because I love Him. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the everything. The beginning and the end. And it is He who pours out His love into us so that we can come to a place where we can feel, man, that's an awesome God. And He's with me. I'm okay. Then verse 8, chapter 5, verse 8. If there's one verse that I will always treasure in my life, and that is the verse in Romans 5, verse 8, that says that God loved us while we were still sinners. Do you know what that means? You cannot out sin God. <laughs> you cannot out sin God. Because He loved you when you were still a sin. He loves you when you are His child. And I often say it. I don't know about you, but having kids teach us a lot about relationship with God. <laughs> There's times where I was so cross with my son. There's times where I wanted to swing him from the ceiling. But he stole my son. And I will forever love him. Because he's my son. And don't you think God feels the same? If he pours out his liquid love into us, he loves us. He loves us even though we were sinners and that can give us peace in this righteousness. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life. And then Paul goes into the last portion of chapter 5 where he speaks about Adam and Christ. Go and read it. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of it. He says, By one man, sin came into this world. And that was Adam. One man brought sin into this world. And that's why he wrote three chapters about how sinful mankind is and how everybody came short of the glory of God. And that verse is outside Christ, in Christ, does not apply, uh, apply to us. Outside Christ, we've come short of the glory of God. And then a whole argument because we are in Adam. But then Paul comes and he says, as one man brought sin on people, so one man, by his death and his justification, <coughs> justified, 
generations after him. Do you see that picture? Christ brought in death. Jesus brought life. And therefore as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness led to justification and life for all men. For as by one man disobedience uh, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be righteous. Amen. Now, <clears throat> so, if somebody tells me I'm in Adam, no way I am not. I am in Christ. Mm. Somebody tells me, yeah, even if we Christians, we are sinners. No, we are no longer sinners. That's entitled for outside Christ. We are children of God. We are in Christ. But we still do sin. But it's different. Mm -hmm. And you will see the difference where what he's going to argue now. In chapter 6, he says, We are dead to sin and alive to God. So, first block. And the second block is slave to righteousness. So we're only going to do these two now. So Romans 6. If you want to explain somebody the baptism, we normally go to chapter 6. So let's read it. Dead to sin alive in God. Sure, you're quiet today. <laughs> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to, st to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Yes. Now, when you go and look at this in different commentaries, some commentaries will say that the baptism is a symbol of you are being baptized into the idea of Christ, being baptized into his death, which was a very philosophic way of saying that you are part of him. And some of the other commentaries will say it's talking physic of a physical baptism. Okay? And I think it doesn't matter which one you argue. Because both of them say that we died with him, that we rose with him. I believe the baptism of water demonstrates it just better. There are other verses that you cannot get by talking about baptism in water. But anyway. So, we were buried therefore with him by baptism in his death, in order that just as Christ were raised from the, the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in the resurrection like His. We know that our old self were crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So he says that we are being baptized into his death. We are crucified with him, we died with him, and we are raised with him. And that is the outcome of this new humanity. You see this whole, where he starts speaking about this new humanity, it's from Abram, we are in Abram, we are blessed in him, and there was a promise for him that in him the ethnos, you and I, will be blessed. So we are part of that promise that God gave to him. And now he comes and then and now he comes and he says that the outflow of this is to become part of this new humanity, we die. The sinful me die. Now it's just interesting how we sometimes take this idea and we make a death cult out. Mm. I remember growing up in a Pentecostal church and this is all the pastor spoke about 
We need to die, you need to die, you need to die, and it's a death every day. And it's part of laying down certain things in our lives. But there's a difference, of, a difference to laying down things and die to something. See, I died with him as Christ died once yes. and rose from the grave. You and I died once, yes. been crucified with him once and rose into a new life. And then he comes and he, and he describes it with baptism. And I don't know if you've been baptized. Mm. Remember that picture? I remember yeah, that picture. Above the water. I, 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 I was diving, one day I was diving crayfish and I had this experience. Above the water I could hear literally the birds chirping and, and I could hear different sounds. And as I, when I do, dive down, there was different sounds under the water. Mm -hmm. And I became so aware of the two worlds. Mm -hmm. The world above water and the world below water. And, and this is what Christ, uh, what Paul is, is trying to explain here. He says that when we die, we, we, we are baptized into his death. You were alive, the old person, and you died and you went under water. And it's like a different world. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know about you, but I can't breathe underwater. <laughs> so when I'm underwater, I can't breathe. It's like as if I die, I can't even breathe. But when you come up out of the water into a new life, what's the first thing you do? <gasps> what's the first thing you do when you were born? <gasps> and if you didn't, <gasps> they give you a hand and tell you, <gasps> but look, you must... <gasps> Because that's a sign of life. It's a sign of life. <coughs> so when we come up out of the water, the first thing we do is like, <gasps> thank God he didn't keep me. <laughs> and it's that into a new life. And, and, I, and I think God gives us a lot of things in the natural so that we can understand the spiritual thing. And if we go through the this natural things or, or spiritual exercises in the natural without understanding the spiritual outcome, it means nothing. And that's what happens with religion. And I think it's starting to happen to the Pentecostal churches as well. We do stuff. And Pentecostal slash charismatic churches. Where we do stuff and we don't even know what it's there for anymore. We don't even know what's the meaning of it anymore. We get baptized because other people are being baptized. It's the same as the other churches. Yeah. If we don't even understand what's happening anymore. We don't even understand the core of it. So I, I, I watched a, a program and said that between 300 to 400 churches closed in America per month. It's shocking. He poured out his liquid love into our hearts. It's a hard thing that needs to happen. Otherwise, it's just mechanical. So when we get saved, when we become part of this ecclesia, when we become part of this new humanity family, we die and we are raised to a new life. And when you look from, from chapter 6, fifth, verse 15 and onwards to the end of chapter 6, He's now arguing the fact that we are, or not we, that you can be a slave to sin. Mm -hmm. The Greek word doulos, um, slave. Now, when we think in terms of slave, we've got a different mindset to a Western mindset in terms of slave. <coughs> to us, a slave is something, once you're a slave, you're always a slave. Mm -hmm. You are bought and you're a slave, you cannot get out of it. When in the time of Paul, in the time of Jesus, there were three ways of becoming a slave. The one was you owed somebody money and you couldn't pay him or repay him. You then become a slave because you are debtor to him. Sounds familiar, eh? Mm -hmm. Bible 
actually warns and says, don't owe no man nothing so that you do not become a slave to that person. Mm. So if you owe somebody money to a point where you couldn't pay him back, you become literally physically his slave. And then in that process, as a slave, you did get a salary. Not like we know slavery today. There was a small, um, what is the pay that you received. And you could save that up. And you could pay the debtor or the, the person that you owe money. And you could pay him and come free of slavery again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the one. The second one is when you take somebody um, in, in, in a war. Mm -hmm. You capture somebody and you take him from another country, from another nation, and you bring him in as a slave. And then there's a third one, and that was where, um, because there was no birth control, people that couldn't look after their babies literally put them on the, what's it, ash? The, 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 Dump. And the rich people will go and fetch the babies. Because they will raise them, but they will raise them as slaves. Mm -hmm. So you were literally born into slavery. So now with this idea, and with the idea of that you can buy yourself free, Paul is saying that when we sin and we are a slave of sin, we can come free of that. Now the logic mindset is I can buy myself free because he's using doers, which is a slave, so, and a slave could buy himself free. But Paul argued for how many chapters and said that we cannot save ourselves. Man is sinful. And we cannot rid ourselves from sin. And then he comes and says, Jesus is our Savior. And he says, if we are hooked in that sin, we are a slave to sin. He says, but you are no longer slaves to sin. Because Jesus paid for us. He paid for our redemption. So, that is like, as a slave, it will take so long, so many years to buy yourself free. And here, this man walks in and says, you can, you can go. That's what it is in terms of the spiritual world for us. The day we decided, Lord, I want to follow you, is the day that that stronghold of slavery in our, li in our lives broke. Mm -hmm. And we can walk free. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole... <coughs> we will continue next week. Chapter 7 and 8 is just all part of the same idea. But can you see the, 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 the progression here? Mm -hmm. From where everything is sinful and, and worshipping nature and all that. And from there, how Jesus came, He paid it. He made everything new. And this is now what's happening to this new man. This new man in, in Christ Jesus. There's a history, and the history is Abram. The promises that was given to him. In this, we are. We die to, to sin. We die to that. We die to... Uh, yeah, to our sins, and, and then the second one, the slavery where we are free from. Mm -hmm. I'm going to close with this idea. I mean, we used it last week as well. You know that if a person committed a crime, let's say we're back in the days where death penalty was stored on the, in the law system. And there's no doubt that that person is guilty. You will die for what he did. If he finds a way to, to commit suicide in the holding cell, the process cannot carry on. Yeah. They can't go and pick somebody else to die for him. Because he already died. They can't, the, the whole process stopped because the person that is guilty is already dead. Mm -hmm. 
Now this is the picture Paul is saying. You and I were that person in the holding cell. We were guilty as charged. And the outcome, and that's when you look at the whole slavery thing, he will speak about the penalty is death. But when so when Christ came, he stood in the gap for us and he paid for our sins, but we also died to our sins. The old man died. And it's the same when, when, when the accuser comes and he says, hang on, you're guilty. It's like, no, that guy does not even live anymore. He died. I've got a date when he died. That person does not live anymore. Isn't that beautiful to know? That in him we died, we rose up into a new life. We are called saints. We are seated in heavenly places. We still do sin. But it's different. And may you this week become so aware that through justification that you are brought into a newness of life. That you are brought into a place where you're no longer a slave. That you will be brought into a place where you are new. Brand new. That he poured out his liquid <clears throat> love into you and because of that you can respond with love mm, yeah. may you become aware of this father i thank you we can sit here no <clears throat> lights no electricity but that we can be so aware of you that we can still know that your power is never all. Your salvation is always there for us. Your salvation has been there for us. It's still there for us. It will always be there for us. And Father, I thank you that in this that you poured out your liquid love into us and that you are drawing closer and closer to you by love and because of love. Father, this week I pray everyone sitting here that you will open up our eyes, our spiritual eyes this week, our spiritual ears, that we will become aware of who we are in you. That we will become aware of who we become or became in you. And I thank you for that. May your name be lifted up through our lives. Father, I pray that our lives will be like a mirror and reflect your glory to our surroundings. Mm. Thank you for that, Father. Bless them. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.